evening, El Paso. Welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where we share the fun of the big questions with you. My name is Dr. Kim Diaz, and I teach philosophy at EPCC. And my name is Jules Simon, and I teach philosophy at the University of Texas, El Paso. So our episode today is about Las Fronteras between philosophy and psychology. Our first guest is Professor Carrie Van Hout, who has been an adjunct psychology instructor at EPCC for the past seven years. And this fall will be her first year as a full-time tenure track instructor. <laughs> she teaches psychology at Valle Verde at the Valle Verde campus. She is a mental health advocate and the faculty advisor for the EPCC student club BAM, bringing awareness to mental health. She runs weekly support groups at EPCC. Look out for the announcement on Blackboard. And then our next guest is Professor Crisola Escobedo. In May of 2007, she received both a BA in psychology and philosophy. And two years later, she received her MA in philosophy from UTEP. In 2010, she went back to EPCC as a faculty member and is currently an assistant professor of philosophy at EPCC and the mental health committee secretary. And our third guest is Professor Christian Salas, who is a native of the borderland, having lived in both Juarez and El Paso. Professor Salas graduated from Burgess High School and attended UTEP, where he graduated with a bachelor's and master's in social work. Mr. Salas, though he holds degrees in social work, Mr. Salas is an experienced musician, having played with and led the UTEP marching band, basketball prep band, UTEP symphony, and even recorded with the USEP Wind Symphony. Professionally, Mr. Salas has served as a clinician, therapist, and student intern supervisor for agencies in Southern New Mexico and El Paso. He has worked with children, adolescents, adults, substance use, abuse, and chemical dependent patients, and oversaw and treated individuals awaiting and returning from federal prison. And Professor Salas is currently the chair of the EPCC Mental Health Committee. Most importantly, he's a tenure track assistant professor of social work at EPCC at Valle Verde campus, and also for Crisol. <laughs> to learn more about their professional achievements, please check out the description box underneath our episode on our YouTube channel at EPCC TV. So, welcome. Yeah, so d during our first um, two seasons here, we've been exploring borders. So we're philosophic dialogues from La Frontera. And so what's the difference between philosophy and history and philosophy and literature and philosophy and psychology? So that's the first question. In order to determine the differences, we'd like to know what you think psychology is. Just some ideas about what kind of focus does a, a psychologist have? What kind of preparation do they need? What kind of, you know, However you want to answer the question, what do you think psychology is? The standard definition of psychology is the study of the brain and behavior, or the study of behavior and cognition, which refers to mental processes. But when I think of psychology, because it's really diverse with lots of different subfields, um, basically every subfield has the same goal, I think, and that's to understand human behavior. So I, I like that, the study of human behavior and cognition. And psychology is a science. <laughs> okay. A lot of people don't think that, but it's it is considered a science. Okay. Yeah. And Crusoe, you've had, got degrees in both psychology and philosophy. So, what do you have to say? So, just as Carrie said, it is a field that uh, I think oftentimes is is not understood properly because when we think of psychology, we think of abnormal behaviors. So usually we think of mental health conditions like depression, schizophrenia, but with uh, you know psychology, you get to study a lot more. So you also get to explore normal behavior. Uh, you also can go many routes. You can study the you know um, clinical psychology, for example, that uh, deals with you know helping people with mental health conditions uh, in in a the, setting where there's therapy, uh, but uh, there's also just research that you do to, to understand how the mind works. Yeah, I, I've 
I like to add because I feel that the work that we do in social work is in definition the, the bridge between the two. Uh, where we take whatever research and whatever uh, findings have been done in psychology and philosophy and we apply them. Uh, we take the research and what the research says, the generalizations that come from that, and we apply it with the individuals, be it in a treatment setting, be it as uh, organizing, uh, understanding different systems, understanding different populations. And with that comes different things from understanding culture, understanding the origins of issues and problems, whether they're organic or inorganic, whether they originated in different ethnic groups and not. Uh, and, and so, and then in essence, we're we're bridging uh, both fields, uh, the philosophical, the psychological, uh, and everything that my peers have mentioned, uh, the different fields within the two. So, and what do psychologists do? Well, we, we've already gotten some of that. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah right? We've gotten some of those practical yeah. applications. Because obviously, like I think in my head, right, like Crystal mentioned, it's, uh, it's, we have a narrow understanding. Most of us have a narrow understanding, and my understanding is quite narrow. I think of somebody with a notepad taking notes while somebody else lays on the couch and talks about their mom. <laughs> but what do psychologists do? Yeah, so that's, that's what everybody thinks of. Actually, when I teach intro psychology, it's an overview of like all the different subfields and mental health is the very last week of the semester, even though I'm so passionate about it. <laughs> but it's because every that's what people think of when they think of psychology. Um, so just like how doctors can have different specializations, like an ENT or an eye doctor, the same thing with psychologists, they can have different specializations. So um, for example, cognitive psychology, which focuses on thinking, all, all mental processes, language development, problem solving, making judgments, or social psychology, which is how we interact with other people, how we think about other people, how we think they're thinking about us. <laughs> um, and we actually behave differently when we're in a group versus when we're alone, so they would explore that. Or um, my background is experimental psychology, which is like research design and the stats part of it. Mm. And my husband is engineering psychology. So um, those are the people that look at how we interact with our man-made environment. So uh, they do a lot of work with like technology, like where to put the start start button on the on your computer, or um, if you ever notice the color of the clock in your car is green, <laughs> and that's because an engineering psychologist has found it's the least distracting color, and that's only what did I mention four? There's so many more developmental school psychology, educational psychology. Um, there's a whole plethora of career opportunities, basically. How cool! How interesting! Mm. I didn't even know that, that you could do engineering psychology. Yeah. Wow. What, in your opinion, is the best thing about being a psychologist or a counselor? I guess that would be a good question. Um, what is the difference between a psychologist and a counselor? First, I, I want to start off with defining what a counselor is because in some circumstances, a counselor can just be a title of someone that is is aimed at assisting somebody, right? That they don't necessarily need to have a degree in psychology, so I call it, uh, uh, social work or in any of the fields leading to mental health or, or uh, social services. Um, but when it comes to a counselor and a psychologist, you know, you're talking about difference in degrees, different abilities of what you can do, whether prescribing medication or not. Uh, so there, def there definitely is a, a set difference, right? Even in the levels of education, even if you throw in social work, you have from in order to do what we kind of come to understand as a counselor, actual treatment, actual uh, mental health and substance abuse counseling or therapy, you require at minimum a master's degree, which can then go into the clinical side, but you still need a license to practice. The same with counseling, you require a degree in psychology, a degree in marriage, uh, mental health counseling, things of that nature, and then achieve your LPC, which is your licensed professional counselor. So, you know, it, it, the words, even social worker, counselor can be used intermittently in some arenas, in some areas, but definitely there comes a weight with those words. Um, on my side, being a therapist, having been a therapist, now an educator, it, it's really rewarding. Um, I use the example of seeing individuals that come into your office on the first day and you could see kind of the weight of the world on their shoulders, right? All the things that they might be presenting with. And through time, uh, 
them really understanding, kind of like Carrie said and Crisol said, using the different methodologies, the different theories, the different approaches that through research we have seen, this is what helps this area, this is what helps this diagnosis, this symptom, and helping the patient, kind of the, the light bulb go off, right? And seeing them go through the work and realizing, wow, you know what? This, what I thought controlled my life, actually I'm the one that controls it. And, and really through CBT and some other types of, of therapies, having them rewire and reframe their, their way of thinking that, well, this is how it's gonna be. No, it's gonna be however you want it to be. And let me give you the tools for you to be able to do that and to achieve that goal. So seeing that kind of when the switch flips on a patient and seeing uh, how they go from day one to as time progresses and treatment progresses, that to me is that my biggest reward, or at least the, the biggest upside of, of being a therapist or being a mental health provider. Just for the sake of our viewers, who might not know uh, what acronyms stand for, what, what is CBT? Uh, CBT mm. is uh, Cognitive Behavior Therapy. Right, and, and can you say a little bit more about that? Sure, so through Cognitive Behavior Therapy, the aim is like I mentioned, reframing the thought process of individuals where you could say, for example, uh, back when I was little, I went to go pet a dog, a neighborhood dog, which never bit anybody, never did anything. And at the exact same time that I went to go pet the dog, it scratched itself. And it just happened that it scratched where my hand was. And so in my mind, I associated dogs with danger, right? That, and so from that point on, I was extremely afraid of dogs. Uh, my aunt had a huge dog that was, you know, like a little teddy bear, and I was like, <gasps> can't do it. But again, that, that's the thought process I had that cause and effect. Dog equals danger. Dog equals this. And so through CBT, granted, I did not go to therapy, but uh, in essence, what I'm trying to get to is we would then work with me <laughs> to reframe that thought of, no, dogs do not equal danger. That one time that happened, but what about every other time that you've had an encounter with a dog? Have you ever gotten scratched, bitten, anything else happened? And helping patients, uh, clients, uh, reframe and, re and redo those connections in their mind that a dog does not equal danger, or does mm -hmm. not equal pain, does not equal you know, that negative outcome. And so that's what we would do in, in CBT, or cognitive behavior therapy. In that way, it's, it's um, we're already gonna bleed into the next question. <laughs> You know, it's like a, a process of dealing with a normative, normative behavior patterns, right? Something like that? Yes, sir. So someone behaves in a certain way, but they, got, they thought that was the normative or the normal way to act, you know, dog attacking me because it's scratching or mm -hmm. something huh. like that. Well, I was thinking about it in like um, hasty generalization uh, for as philosophers. A yeah, <laughs> right, as a philosopher, well, if you study informal fallacies just because the dog scratched you it doesn't follow that all dogs scratch it's uh, you know we're generalizing from the sample being super small mm -hmm. right so that's how I was looking at it in terms of philosophy it's but as a child right you don't know that that's that Definitely. you're committing an informal fallacy right, yeah. Well, um, this leads me to the next next question, well, and maybe maybe Crusoe can, okay. can address this because, um, or she can start. Uh, so, uh, if someone is having some kind of um, abnormal behavior practices, would you then recommend him to her or her to 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 uh, engage with a, a their therapist, and their local a, a therapist, <laughs> and have and be uh, involved in a, some kind of CBT therapy, or have them take Kim's logic class. Well, <laughs> but know, I, which, 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 let's let's ask our panel. I, yes. I think you would prefer to teach them logic, right? Yes, but <laughs> what I would, what how how are, what is the border right between philosophy? That's the topic of today's conversation, because it's like they're okay. See, this is why. When I was an undergrad, I don't know if this happened to you, you would tell people, I'm a philosophy major, and then people would be like, oh, psychology, that's great. <laughs> My cousin is majoring in psychology. And then I would be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. What is the difference? Are they, you know, what are the similarities? Well, um, I'll, I'll start by saying that there's similarities uh, because there's room for overlap. 
So for example, in, in a logic class, we, we teach cognitive biases. And that's something that is taught in psychology too. And there's a lot of different uh, approaches to therapy that seek to merge the two. So there's, for example, existential therapy. There's also dialectical behavior therapy that you know, merges both philosophical ideas and just reframes them to deal with particular mental health conditions. So there is a lot of room for overlap. Stoicism, too, is, is, um, is something that uh, some, some therapists are looking to in order to uh, be able to deal with mental health conditions like related to depression, to, to anxiety. So there's, there's that room where they both meet, and, and, and I think the border there is, is a little fuzzy. Um, but then uh, philosophy does study things that wouldn't be addressed necessarily in psychology. Uh, so then philosophy ends up being one of those broader fields that uh, can include what we study in, philosophy, in psychology. So, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, psychology started off as philosophy. And yeah. The father of psychology would be a philosopher, uh, William James. But I think ultimately another difference, aside from the fact that in 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 philosophy we also study things like metaphysics and and epistemology, which there's an overlap there too. Uh, but it's the methods. So then, as Carrie mentioned, uh, psychology is a science. So. You know, to come up with um, claims made by a psychologist and exploring the human mind, you need to use the scientific method. And in philosophy, we there's different approaches, of course, but there's also the rational analysis and the emphasis on logic in, in some cases. Not all traditions will, will do that in, in philosophy, but uh, you know we, we have different ways of exploring our topic. Yeah, but until recently, there was a pretty stiff resistance of philosophers to do what's called experimental, experimental philosophy, and that was something that social scientists do or psychologists do. But lately, in the last, you know, 15 years or so, 10, 15 years, you know, philosophers have turned to experimental psychology as providing data for their ways they reflect on certain kind of social patterns and things like that. So I think there is increasingly, and, and there's a whole sub-discipline in philosophy called um, philosophy of psychology. So, And there's also moral psychology. So, right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's From the other direction. Yeah. Yeah, and the metaphysics of where is the mind? Is the mind in the brain, <laughs> or <laughs> or is the mind out something else? You know, <laughs> but the substance, the substance is the brain. But then, where is the mind? Are they? Yeah, you know, um, is the mind a, a different type of substance than than the material brain? These are the questions that we. The philosophers that keep us late <laughs> up at night. <laughs> we really learn, the way that he, most humans learn is through making associations. Mm -hmm. It's called associative learning. And so I, I thought it was really interesting that you were like, well, this isn't logical, I, I can't follow this. Like, why would you assume? <laughs> but that's, that's how humans learn, mm -hmm. like naturally, right? And it's mm -hmm. like, if you go to Subway and eat a tuna salad sandwich and get oh, food poisoning. Yeah. That has happened to me. <laughs> not, not at Subway. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, know. you know, yeah. you don't go back to Subway the next day and order a tuna salad sandwich, right? So even though, logically speaking, it's probably a different tuna or something, right? We have, we, those associations are strong. And especially since you were a kid, um, because it's not really until age three and a half that we start having memories for our personal experiences, but babies can have memories for those associations too, right? So, um, like for example, Vera's probably not gonna remember my dad because he's older, he's in his late 70s, but she's going to associate like seeing a picture of him in a photo album with like happiness and good fuzzy mm -hmm. feelings, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other differences or similarities between psychology and philosophy that you all think are, I think, we're all trying to figure out how to be happy, how to live and be happy, <laughs> yeah. you know? Well, along the same lines of, of, of marrying both, si uh, both aspects, in 
looking at ways that psychologists, uh, clinical psychologists, clinicians and such are looking at treating mental health disorders or mental illnesses. You're looking at some uh, issues of morality, uh, especially uh, in the last couple of years that where some states have um, voted on using psychedelic drugs yeah. to ease depression, anxiety, uh, schizophrenia symptoms. And so you could argue whether that's uh, you know, morally correct. Is the research behind it adequate? You know, are, are we really focused on the, are we just saying it just because we want to have individuals use psychedelic drugs like uh, hallucinogens uh, to may have this connection with the exterior world and, and uh, have these warm fuzzy feelings that help reduce things like depression, anxiety, and so on and so forth help uh, control or diminish uh, hallucinations or have them be the ones in control of the hallucinations and therefore make those associations of reality versus um, not real and so on and so forth. And so again, it begs to question not only, okay, research shows that this will help, right? So the psychology side of it shows this is gonna help reduce the symptoms when it comes to mental illness and mental disorders. But then the philosophical side, uh, in this sense, the moral side saying, is this, is this right? You know, and then we get into the whole definition of what's right, what's wrong. Morally, is this the right way to go? Um, you know, pharmacological side, you know, is this, is this better than using this other type of medication? Do we have the research behind? So it really goes along <clears throat> the conversation that we've had about not only mirroring or marrying both sides, but how things can really tiptoe the line between one and the other and how those two can really interact and, and interweave themselves into each other. Well, not only that, and Kim promised that I was going to take us on some tangents, so I have to... <laughs> I <laughs> have to deliver on the promise, right? Um, I mean, it, it seems as though in, in all of our scientific disciplines, we work with categories, you know, thought categories. And, um, you know, for a, a psychologist, I, I imagine, well, the psychologists I've talked to, and I know some, um, you know, they work with categories like what's normal or what's real. And so they accept those kind of stipulated definitions for what's normal or what's real. And, it, you know, that can get people in difficulty, put them in difficult sort of situations. Like, is it normal for um, someone who has a mental uh, disability to be, um, you know, tried as an adult? tried as a normal functioning adult mm -hmm. and a psychologist is going to make that determination in a court mm -hmm. right and then make the determination on what's real you know and what's and how this person is processing what's real and whether or not they should then be punished or put to death or go to prison so I think there's a huge responsibility that then relies on how psychologists are dealing with the conceptions that they bring into their practice, right? That was a tangent. I don't, I don't know where to, where to go for it, but it seems like the philosophers and psychologists have to work together yeah. because there are these overlapping, as Chris Ole said, overlapping sorts of practices in the two fields where psychologists, you know, they're, um, you know, at least they profess to deal with, you know, conceptions of, what is real, and what's normal, and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you then, what is the main goal of philosophy? So if, if psychology, if the main goal is to understand human behavior, what would you say with philosophy? What the main goal? That's good, so I just can't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, do you want to go first? I can, I can go. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a little, you know, uh, I think psychology, in, in, some, in some ways, in some ways, philosophy is much broader than understanding just human behavior. Mm -hmm. That seems, you know, for, from our perspective, a philosopher's perspective, understanding human behavior a is a subcategory of uh, human action, you know, oh, and, that, and, and, it's a very, and, it, and because it's theoretically defined, it's a kind of a narrow sort of way to, to kind of categorize one's one field of study. In fact, we used to have a question on here that says, 
you know, is psychology still um, stuck in just the model of behaviorism? You know, that, that kind of model that you know, B.F. Skinner made famous. But right? I, I want to take it even wider and say, it, for me, is to understand, to, an attempt to understand, um, because, and not just human behavior, like an attempt to understand what is real, um, how come, right? Which takes us, can take us into physics, right? Like, okay, how come it seems solid, but really there's a lot of empty space in there? Subatomically, you know, and so not not just human action or behavior, but understanding what is real and what is right and what is wrong, and just understanding. I would put it well to understand. And now, if presumably, if I understand, um, I can make better choices and get along better, live life. What would you say, Isabel? I think that question uh, resonates with me because as an undergrad, I did have to make a choice between psychology and philosophy. And I, I remember that choice being a difficult one and precisely talking about, well, what's my goal? What do I want to do? And um, at the time, I, was, uh, I, I had experience working at various psychology labs and uh, getting a sense of how the research was conducted, and ultimately we wanted to find out the truth about you know, why people are the way that they they are. And in, in philosophy, we did that too. We, we wanted to know the truth, but I noticed the differences in methods. So for example, uh, in, in the lab that I was working uh, in, there, there was an emphasis of using the research to justify whatever claim I was willing to make. Um, at the time, I was investigating locus of control, and um, I wanted to see if particular viewpoints affected the way that we behaved out in the world. Like, if you were more likely to attribute what happens to you, to you as an agent, so if you had internal locus of control as opposed to external locus of control where you, being, you, you, you identify the cause somewhere outside of you. So uh, I was uh, doing all these experiments, investigating, uh, just conducting research, asking people you know, what their views are to, to get to that claim. And uh, I, I kept thinking, how can this go wrong? There was so many jumps I was taking, so many assumptions I was making. And in philosophy, one of the things that I think was like, what drove me to philosophy was the fact that we take those assumptions and we question them to see, does it really follow? Uh, are claims uh, really, uh, what we, what, when we make claims, do we really have the justification for that? And, um, you know, and, I've got to be honest, uh, within philosophy, you know, just you ask a question and you, you don't necessarily have to get an answer, you get more questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there was comfort in knowing that we were taking those assumptions and dismantling them to get to what is the case. And um, I imagine that that's done in psychology too. Uh, it's just, uh, I think um, you do that not just with one experiment, but it's an ongoing uh, conversation that you have with people who are investigating the same thing you are. I've noticed too, um, like with psychology, like you'll have um, like stoicism, right? Like you'll have, in philosophy you'll have stoicism, and you'll have philosophies, but with psychology, psychologists, they're, they're more step one, step two, step three, and so the philosophy gets reduced to a method like cognitive behavioral therapy. Look, because you're thinking this way, you're f or rational emotive behavioral therapy, which was the, the precursor to it, right? Because you're thinking this way, you're feeling this way, and you're behaving this way. So if we question the assumption, but so it's like a nicer condensed method for treatment versus the writings of the Stoics, you'll find the nuggets in there, but you don't have a nice, this is like a nice method, or you know with Kant, right, like 
you'll find it there, the constructivism of Kant, but you don't have this. It seems to me that psychologists can, they, what they do is they distill the, all the theory from philosophy and are able to apply it much more effectively to cases whereas philosophers continue to speculate and keep asking, you know, going back and back in questions. My sense. <laughs> well, you know, I think you're doing a bit of injustice to okay. kind of normative and applied fields of philosophy, right? Okay. <laughs> I mean, philosophers are not just all speculators. No, no, but we speculate a lot. We do speculate <laughs> a lot, but, but no, I think I speculate following, speculate following what, what Corsol said, you know, getting getting to the truth of the matter, mm -hmm. right, is getting to, is this really the case of something? So, you know, one thing, it, one thing that, you know, my, at least my general experience in, in psychology has been that you show symptoms or present symptoms, as you put it, Chris, right? You know, you present with a certain kind of profile, right? And then a psychologist is trained to take those pre that presentation, behavior patterns, and make a diagnosis, right, for the sake of the treatment. Whereas a philosopher might say, well, you know, let's talk about your family history, but, you know, what is your, what's the social agenda going on as well? And there's a broader, seems to me, a broader way of getting at uh, the cause-effect relations in philosophy than there is in psychology because you're geared towards the therapy geared towards therapy and psychology. Whereas in philosophy, we're geared towards, you know, being critical and raising questions. <laughs> and, you know, is that the final answer, you know? I yeah. want to go on to the next question because you are our mental health committee, oh, yeah. EPCC mental health committee. So what is, let's start with what is mental health? And then what is the mental health committee doing? What's mental health? Ooh, that's, that's a tough okay. one. <laughs> Met with silence. <laughs> so mental health is something that everyone has, just like how everyone has physical health, right? And you can be in good or bad physical health, and the same thing, you can have good or poor mental health. Um, so when I think of mental health, I think of what are your thoughts like? How do you talk to yourself? <laughs> um, you know, how do you think about other people? How do you think other people think about you? Like, um, it's all about your thoughts about the mind. It's the health of the mind instead of the body, mm -hmm. essentially. I don't, I don't want to say, but I think my, I, I, I think of it more in the sense of what are you able to, and uh, this might get me in trouble with Chris, so <laughs> but you know, what are you able to control? What do you have a handle on, right? Uh, like uh, Carrie said, these everybody has either healthy or un unhealthy mental health. Uh, at least on my end, the definition between one and the other is what are you able to control? What do you have the coping skills for? What do you have the, the ability to manage? Uh, when that starts to get out of control and out of your hands, in essence, that's when we start having mental health issues, right? Uh, that could potentially uh, snowball into mental illness. Whereas mental health could be, you know, someone cut you off in the, at the start of the day and that put you in a really bad mood. And so you might not be in the right state of mind to go listen for, to your professor for an hour and a half, right? Because you're still thinking like, ah, oh, the bastard put me off or whatever and, you know, spilled coffee on me and got this. And so it might throw a little wrench into your day. But All after, drivers are bad drivers. Right, <laughs> right. And, but, but maybe halfway through the day, you forget about what happened in the morning and you're back in, again, a positive state of mind. You're, you're back to your typical, right? Whereas if that incident would have propelled you to have a bad day, which then propelled you to have a bad week, and then it just perpetuates so on and so forth, then it's starting to get out of your control, right? You don't have the coping skills. You don't have the way of managing that one incident. And now it's in essence, cause these issues in other facets of your life, be it work, be it home, be it your you know, social relationships and such. And then we start getting into 
more of the, are you meeting the criteria? Going back to what Dr. Simon said, you know, those symptoms. Are you meeting the symptoms that you need to check off to be diagnosed with a mental illness? So it's kind of what, kind of what came before the chicken or the egg. Uh, uh, mental health, we all have positive or good or bad mental health or healthy mental health. But eventually, or at, at some point, that could trickle down or snowball, whatever analogy you want to use, into a mental illness if you start to check off those boxes of symptoms that, that uh, we, as, uh, we call our purple Bible, you know, the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health, the DSM-5, um, dictates that you know, in order to, or if you have depression, if you have these five symptoms and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's my very long-winded answer as to the, the definition of mental health. And I, I personally think that it's super important for us to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, you know, and I'm, I've noticed that post or even if we're, it seems to me, obviously there's still COVID, people are still getting sick, but we're more, it seems to me, I'd like to believe, at the other end of it. But pre-pandemic, it was at least, and it seemed to me that people didn't want to talk about mental health. Um, or it was, nah, no, just like talking about personal finance, you know, like we don't discuss these things, you know, but with the pandemic, it really made it very obvious that this is really important and, um, and it's important to talk about it. Why should we talk about it? Is it... I mean, you know, what's the problem with talking about it? What is your sense about Well, I have a different question yeah? because you're part of this group too. You're part of the mental health committee. I try to help a little. Right. <laughs> and so, it seems to me like a committee like yours um, basically has, well, many functions, but at least two. One is to promote good mental health practices, but also to identify ones where people are, you know, students especially, but also faculty, are having mental health issues, right? Or problems that they might be going through. So it seems like there's this, this twofold, twofold emphasis. And it just, you know, it occurred to me, like, as, as you were speaking, Chris, you was like, well, where's the dividing line? When you have so many symptoms, uh, <laughs> you have, do you have an accumulation of symptoms? Or is there like a, a tipping point or something like that between mental illness and mental health, right? It doesn't, does it scream out and shout to you saying, here, I'm mentally sick, right? Um, or, you know, do you have like kind of really firm, solid ways to determine that somebody is, you know, stable and able to control I have their a, everyday activities? I have a theory on why we didn't let or dismiss mental health. And it has to do with, um, with patriarchy as though it's... Um, you know, it's not important. Or, you know, you need to be strong and not let, no, don't be weak. You know, only weak people talk about that. I think also there's a lot of stigma that comes with it. So for example, if, uh, I'll, I'll use this because, uh, you know, borderline personality disorder as an example. It comes with a lot of negative connotations, like uh, some of the symptoms that you would check those boxes for would be instability, emotional instability, uh, just also the manipulation aspect to it, the impulsiveness that comes with it too. So if you come out and say something like, well, you know, I've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, it kind of changes the way that people look at you. And, you know, all of a sudden you feel like, okay, well, oh, she has that disorder. That means that I need to be careful because, or he, because males can have it too, <laughs> you know, that all of a sudden, you know, you have people kind of walking on eggshells when they're around you. And uh, same thing with something like antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic uh, personality disorder, that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it's like, and you're saying hi to someone and you don't know they have those conditions, you're like, hey, buddy. But then if, you know, this person has antisocial personality disorder, it's more like, hey, buddy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of stigma with that. Mm -hmm. And um, 
also just a, a lack of understanding of what this is. Uh, I know, um, from, for example, my mom, um, he, she had schizophrenia and, you know, she, she displayed symptoms um, ever since she was 15, 16 years old. But the solution was to take her to a curandera because she had been cursed. It, it, it was easier to attribute the cause to something mystical than to, yeah, to, to say, you know, it's, it's a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's why uh, not only as, as a professor, but even as a practitioner, as a clinician, I used to make sure that my patients understood what, not the diagnosis was, but what their symptoms were. Right? And even as a professor, I instill that in my students. I like, don't see somebody as someone with depression because everyone in this room could be diagnosed with depression but dealing with different symptoms. Right? And so it's about understanding those symptoms, the way they manifest in, in, in an individual because you forget, or we, we, we might not forget, but we might not understand that the symptom, this, those are just like lines on a text, right? And they can be, mani or they might manifest completely different on individuals. They might be able to check that off, but that means, you know, depression, for example, you sleep too much or you sleep too little. It can also be subjective, right? How much is, what's their baseline for you might be too much for somebody. It might be too less for someone else. Does that make you fall under the symptoms of depression? No, that's my typical, right? Uh, so it's about understanding, like you said, not only Oh, it's, uh, it goes on to the labeling of individuals, right? Uh, and, and we might fall under that, that uh, not misconception, but that fallacy of, oh, it's a person with ADHD. Oh, it's that autistic kid. Oh, it's that depressed person. Because even depression, it can be an outward or an inward expression, uh, manifestation of symptoms. Whereas for females, my apologies, we tend to see that closing off, right? The, I don't want to do anything. I'm going to keep to myself. Whereas in males, especially in teenagers, it might be the opposite. Maybe anger, outward expression of these symptoms. The, the individual that is upset and mad at the world all the time, well, it's not a conduct issue. That could be his way of manifesting symptoms of depression. So it, it really, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it really has a lot to do with the labeling of individuals of, you know, are we doing more harm than helping someone by just saying, oh, you're depressed, instead of taking it to the next step or the next stage of explaining what those symptoms are. I've had individuals that come to my office when I was a clinician say, oh, I have depression. Really, what does that look like? And they tell me all the symptoms of anxiety <laughs> or vice versa. I, I've, I've, been, I've been anxious all my life, really. And they tell me all the symptoms of depression. So it's going back to the stigma of what is that? What does that look like? And in reality, what is it manifesting? How is it manifesting in you? And are we as professionals, as educators, as you know, whatever your role, your title is, are you doing that job? We, we talk about the roles, at least in social work, sometimes we're an educator. Are you teaching somebody what that label means? Or just, here's a label, congratulations, you're not depressed. <laughs> mm -hmm. The fallacy that you were speaking about in, in the philosophy speak, uh, Whitehead, calls it the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, where it's uh, everything is always changing, even if it's in tiny, minute form, right? But um, yeah, things don't stay the same. Definitely. And so to concretize, you know, I am depressed. Uh, I may be depressed right now, but when I go to sleep, that stops. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? Or so, yeah. the opposite. We by putting that label, you might reinforce whatever the individual perceives as, again, the depressed, and now they start manifesting the symptoms that they believe come with that label, rather than right. what they truly were feeling and, and what they're really emoting. What are you hoping to do as mental health committee members for the college and the community? Yeah. Well, when we first started, our purpose was to provide mental health services to the students at El Paso Community College. So um, keeping in mind, our focus was more mental health, not mental illness, because a lot of times people um, blur the lines between the two. But that was our main goal, and we've actually, we're, we're in the process of achieving it. So Chris, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk more about... Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, Carrie uh, was 
kind of our the the grandmother of the the godmother, not the grandmother. Sorry, I don't want to put the the wrong title. Uh, the godmother of the the mental health committee, uh, and and she was our our uh, the the person that initiated was tasked with bringing awareness of mental health to the campus and and really pushing through a, a paper that she wrote uh, based on the student mental health survey. Uh, which really garnered a lot of support from the EPCC uh, uh, cabinet, so Dr. Serrata, the president and the vice presidents, to the point that uh, Dr. Paula Mitchell was working on a project with uh, Oscar Velasquez, the district-wide coordinator for counselors, on social services for students. And when uh, uh, Dr. Smith kind of saw these two entities were working on similar areas, like why don't you guys work together? So we created a task force and we've been working on bringing Dr. Mitchell and Carries and the Mental Health Committee's vision of uh, services to students at EPCC. And so we're working on that, we've acquired funding, we're looking at space, we've, uh, each dean at each of the campuses has identified space where this could happen. So we don't have a title for it yet, uh, we're talking or calling it the Mental Health Social Services Task Force at the moment, where it will be a one-stop shop where we'll have clinicians for students to come in and do kind of solution focus. In other words, whatever issues they're facing at that point in time, they will have someone available to speak to a trained clinician, be it an LPC or licensed professional counselor, excuse me, an LMSW, licensed master social worker, licensed clinical social worker, not with the aim of treating mental illness, like Carrie was saying, but treating mental health, kind of the day in, day out stressors that could potentially cause students to miss class and do poorly in school and therefore dropping out of school, but to try and avoid those situations. Um, like Carrie said, our, our vision and our focus is not solely on student mental health now, but we're looking at expanding our potential outlook of not just students, but including our faculty including our not only current faculty, but retired faculty, as you know, Dr. Diaz, uh, with the initiative that you brought on with uh, creating a, uh, a, a retired creating faculty a association. Vote yes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So our scope has really widened in the last couple of years where we've seen this vision of bringing mental health awareness and mental health services to students, and not just at Valle Verde, but our outlook is to have a, this center, this the service, at all of our campuses across the district. But then again, also including student mental health, faculty and staff, and also uh, retired faculty mental health as part of this, uh, the focus of our committee's work. And when are you going to, when is the center, when can we go check out the center? Uh, we, we don't expecting? have a, right, we don't have a, a tentative date yet, but we're looking at having somebody at least at Valle Verde starting off, consider like as a pilot sometime this fall, so the fall of 2022, okay. but for sure the spring of 2023. And again, depending on uh, the onboarding process, uh, the way we would like to phase this in uh, would be having someone at Valle Verde first and potentially having that individual or those individuals going to campus to campus. Once Valle Verde is set, we'll go to the Northwest campus in Mission del Paso to cover the entire county and the district wide, and then eventually incorporating the rest of the campuses of the district of El Paso Community College. And uh, well, I had a question. Oh, no, um, a smart ass comment. <laughs> you know, students are just gonna ask us to do away with presentations and finals and that would take care of their anxiety, right? <laughs> but no, okay. My next question, I, I wanna ask this next one is, we've been talking a lot about mental health and the overlap between philosophy and psychology and I wonder why we humans sometimes do things that are engaged in behavior where we shoot ourselves in the foot. And the way that I had phrased that question was, why do people do bad things? So I, I think um, there are some underlying tendencies that we have that can promote certain behavior that could be seen as bad. And uh, it's a matter of reinforcing that behavior or you know, also reinforcing behavior that we consider good. 
So there's an excellent book that I read called The Origins of Good and Evil by Paul Bloom. I don't know if anybody else has read it. I've read Beyond Good and Evil, but <laughs> it's, not, not, it's not the same one. Not the origins not the of good <laughs> So it, it, it's work done in moral psychology. So uh, the book explores different uh, experiments done in order to gauge whether, first of all, morality is something that comes natural to us as humans. And then a second goal is to identify uh, what are the seeds there that can then grow one way or another. And then finally, make re recommendations on how we can alter behavior. So one of those, for example, is something called coalition formation. And I always talk about coalition formation. Uh, and in, in philosophy, we recognize this as the one versus the other, right? So the natural tendency, for example, that we have to associate with people like us and mm -hmm. as a group establish ourselves as the one. And then the other group then becomes the other. So they did various experiments to, to uh, identify the origins of collision formation and how quickly we can form those groups and how quickly those behaviors can get out of hand. So they talked, for example, this one experiment, and it was at a summer camp, that they just simply gave the kids different color t-shirts, yeah. put them in groups, and that was enough to create so much conflict and you know them being so mean to one another. So I think there is something there like natural tendencies that then we can either, uh, now that we know we have them, we can uh, intervene, right? We can do things so that they don't start throwing rocks at one another just because they're wearing a different colored t-shirt. Or we can also do things without wanting to, to just promote that kind of behavior and then have things get out of hand. And for that particular experiment, I believe it all it took is two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they had to cancel the whole thing. They had to send the kids home because it was too intense. Mm -hmm. And um, there was another similar experiment that was done. And then um, what ended up uniting the two groups was a common goal. Yeah like a, a common enemy that then they could say, now we are us, and then that's the other. Yeah. yeah. So, and there's a lot of experiments like that. So not just in terms of, um, you know, group association, there's experiments done uh, gauging uh, the moral tendencies in babies, for example, and if they recognize something like fairness, which they do. Mm -hmm. So do dogs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and no, it's true. Toddlers are naturally helpful. Like if you drop something, they'll pick it up, they'll hand it to you, but it takes them but a little bit. they put it in their mouth first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> first I do that, yeah. Um. You gotta test if it's okay to hand it to you. <laughs> well, we, well, we only have a few minutes left. Um, do we have a, a final question? Well, could I add something really quick? Yeah, yeah. Is it, go ahead and ask. One of my students brought this up because we were, we were sort of talking about what you were talking about in class and um, as they're reading the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie and practicing a principle each week. And they were practicing the um, give honest and sincere appreciation. And we were talking about like, well, how do we appreciate people that are bad and what makes bad and things like that. They and, make um, us look good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, but one of my students said something and, and he was spot on and it was also a point that was made in the book that people, in psychology we have this idea that people believe that they're good. Like we want to think that we're good people, we do good things, we want to like ourselves, right? We want to feel like we're good people. And a lot of times, people who do bad things, they don't view them as bad, mm -hmm. right? They always justify it. They always come up with something to, like even with the shootings, right? There's always like a manifesto, like this is why I'm doing it. They see themselves as, I don't know if they don't necessarily see themselves as doing something good, but they don't see themselves as doing something bad, you know? Yeah, so I, I just, thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, so speaking of all this overlaps between psychology and philosophy made me think about this um, cemetery in Culiacán, Sinaloa, where it's a, it's a phenomenon. I don't know how long this has been going on for narcos. Their, part of their legacy is to leave a mausoleum that is, um, very fancy, a very fancy mausoleum. So anyway, I was just thinking about what we value and um, 
yeah how the values depending on where we grow up and so we may end up doing things that are bad but under that paradigm it's good as you were saying you know we we think we're doing a good thing by shining in that paradigm and leaving a, the legacy of a mus mausoleum anyway okay so on but to it, our last but question it, but yeah. it, but, <laughs> right but it, it unifies people and cultures and cultures to pay attention to them but based on bad actions yeah but to <laughs> right? them it's good right well because they're unifying people but ultimately mm -hmm. they're but they're doing it for drug money and extortion and things like that well they're doing it yeah through through extortion and through extortion our last question having studied psychology as you have do you think it's possible for humans to live in peace what would a psychologist's task be to create a more peaceful if world we, you know if yeah i mean if our values depend on our context what you know who who are we to normalize to say this is normal this is good this is yeah uh, i i think uh again from the clinician perspective i th um, i always use the definition of what it is that i do I, I help people achieve their highest potential right because that takes my subjective view out of it in other words what they perceive as and what they see as their highest potential when they reach that, my job is done to an extent, right? Uh, and, and it really puts that definition on them. I could see a lot of potential on an individual, but they can be like, man, you know what? Thank you very much. I'm great. Oh, you got so much. No, they've gotten out of me what they've needed, right? So can they achieve inner, inner peace? Most definitely, right? Because that's their definition. I think when we talk, at least from my perspective, when we talk about can people as, as a whole, as, as a people, then what I think we're trying to fit everyone into the same category. Uh, and then it gets hard to conceptualize what, uh, what peace is for everybody, right? Can that work for a city, for a school, for a classroom? You're always gonna have those like, that doesn't, that, that doesn't equal peace for me, right? Case in point, my Cowboys play today. For some people they're like, if they lose, I'm in peace. That's not peace for me, <laughs> right? Or my minors play or whoever we have various definitions of what peace is, right? What brings you peace? So can we achieve inner peace and peace amongst, for us as an individual? Most definitely. At the broader view, I think that's a little difficult because then we'd have to, as you were talking about earlier, that overgeneralization and creating one definition of peace that meets every single individual. And I think that would be the issue of, of what is that definition? Even at the micro level, when we work with one individual, one patient, even one family, we have multidisciplinary teams, right? That you have the medical prescriber, you have the psychologist, you have the psychiatrist, you might have the probation officer. So like we all said, you have multiple professions, multiple people that are working towards assisting that one person, that it can be done by one individual. Even that one individual, we're trying to get resources and connect those, that patient, that client, with outside entities, right? Um, you know, things that even as, as faculty, we do. We don't, we don't work in silos, you know, just because I'm in social work doesn't mean I don't know other faculty from criminal justice, from psychology, heck, even from English, right? And so our ultimate goal at that point, our piece is ensuring the betterment in, in the education of our students. And if we stick to those silos, right, of, oh, I, I'm, I'm in the social work program, well, I don't care what English is doing, then we're really not helping achieve that goal. Awesome. That is awesome. Uh, it's a good advertisement for carrying on di good, good, healthy mm -hmm. dialogues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Definitely. Well, thank you so much to our team and our producer, our audience, our guests. Thank you. Um, this has been Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. Check out our other YouTube videos and join us next time. Mm -hmm.